I think I'll start. Hello and everyone and warmly welcome to Lund. My name is uh, Rasmus Törnblom and I'm the deputy mayor here in Lund municipality. Warmly welcome. Uh, right now we are here in Lund Innovation District. And Lund Innovation District is this area of the map in Lund where, you, where we have Sweden's most top-ranked innovation environmental uh, environment, environment with uh, one of the world's top 100 ranked universities. Last year, uh, Professor Anne Luyer was granted the Nobel Prize in Physics. And um, the collaboration between the university, the local companies, the industry, as well as the local authorities is one reason that we have this good and good innovative environmental climate. In Lund we also have global companies such as Tetra Pak, Alfa Laval and Axis Communications working together with the university, together with the local authorities and working for a, to develop this Lund Innovation District. In the most northeastern part of Lund Innovation District we have ESS, European Spallation Source, and, Max, and the MAX4 Laboratory. And we are very proud of this Lund Innovation District, and I would like to shortly guide you through it. So first of all, uh, we have 25,000 workplaces here, 45,000 students. Lund Central Station, which, which you can see in the south, is the is Sweden's third largest railway station, if you uh, counter passengers. About 60% of all the workplaces in Lund municipality is located in this lighted area. And the area is, well, the innovation district uh, has a tramway that connects the northeastern part in, uh, with ESS and MAX4 and the central station. We're also started th this co-action project together with local companies and with the university and other uh, stakeholders in Lund and trying to stop. It's a large scale system demonstrator focusing on energy and transport. And together we are trying to develop pathways for deep structural change and establishing a place-based uh, demonstration of how new systems can look, feel and work. And this focus is the focus level uh, innovation uh, gives us very good opportunities to together innovate and get ideas together. So, of course, the university is a very important part of this, envirom and uh, this innovation environment. We are especially proud from the local authorities, uh, from the municipality, uh, that uh, we are good at life science, smart materials such uh, that are developed or tested in MAX4 laboratory and in ESS. We also have companies working with clean tech, mobility, IoT and AI, smart cities and space. So it's a lot of things that happens in this area. Finally, in a couple of years we will have two of Europe's lar largest uh, research centers facilities located in Lund Innovation District. We have ESS, European Spallation Source, that will open 27-28, and we already have this MAX4 laboratory that uh, is operational since 2016. And the European Spallation Source is a unique facility, and uh, focusing on mat material research with 13 other European uh, countries working together, and Sweden and Denmark are the hosts. So, finally, I hope you all enjoy your conference. We're very glad that you chose to host it here in Lund. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasmus. <coughs> uh. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> My name is Per Lööfberg. I'm a senior product manager at Elon Road. I'm one of your moderators today. And I'm Lena Nordin. I'm from VTI. I'm the Swedish National Transport and Road Research Institute. So, 
Welcome. Welcome. And uh, we are here as representatives of, well, you can say uh, our ho the hosts for this, uh, this whole day, Evolution Road, uh, which is a project uh, focused on trying out an electric road system technology from a company called Elon Road. Uh, but this conference is also, I mean, we've been working together for, what is it, five, six years now? Yeah, yeah something like that. In this like project, that. yeah. Yeah. And uh, what we've come to is so much more than just one particular technology. We've learned so much. There's been a number of, of, of uh, organizations involved, and you can see them all listed uh, here on that roll-up. And in a way, this is a final conference for our project, but it's much more than that. It's actually not really any... We, this is not an electric road system conference. This is a, an attempt to dive deep into what's actually needed uh, to transition from fossil fuels to, to uh, electrification of transport, which is a challenging task uh, with many, many aspects and angles. And everyone has been on conferences where we all say, let's work hard together, yeah, let's go. And there are all kinds of companies here, direct competitors to Elon Road, for example, who have interesting and great technologies. Uh, we have politicians, we have researchers, uh, we have uh, public civil servants. I think we have a couple of uh, visitors from the government as well today. Uh, what the foundation for this conference is, is actually a meta study. You can say a few words about that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, it was, I would say it was about a year ago that we realized that, well, everyone, we read all these uh, reports and we read all articles and so on about the electrification and, and, and they all seem to come up with different results. So we wanted to see what's, what's the thing about that. So uh, we uh, started a meta study uh, or, or the project sort of decided to fund <laughs> a meta study where we included RICE um, to look into this. So there are, what are we, uh, you were going to talk about yes. the, <laughs> the authors the, of the, the... Absolutely, the authors are, the, and the, the head author is Jacob Rogstadius. Can you say hi, Jacob? He's uh, in Jacob the is right back. there. Uh, supported by Mats Alakula, right there. Lena Nordin, right there. Patrick Plötz. And you are somewhere in the room? In Germany? He's in Germany. <laughs> He's in Germany. <laughs> and uh, Francisco Marquez Fernandez. Also in the back. Right there in the back. So uh, it's very much thanks to them that we've come to this depth. And you are all incredibly important for us and for the study. Yeah. Uh, the study was also conducted in a way that we had a reference group. And, and this is something that you will discuss later on. So we will not dig too much into this right now. We hope that you will learn something today and tomorrow. We, I'm sure I will learn something. Uh, you all represent different aspects of the transition, the green transition that we are all trying to achieve in different ways. Uh, you all sit with knowledge that not everyone has. It's super important that you talk to each other uh, no one knows how to do this. Jacob and team has been trying to figure out what are the actual real challenges, what are the things that people are shutting their eyes to, they don't actually understand or know, we don't know. And what are the things that can be done, must be done, could be done, and are impossible. And we have chosen an array of speakers who have different experiences and aspects, they represent different aspects of this whole transition from energy companies to people who build infra charging infrastructure to researchers. And our first speaker, our keynote speaker, to set the tone, is Professor David Seabon, right there. And I just want to give you a little introduction, David. David, David Seabon is a professor of mechanical engineering in Cambridge University and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. He is director of the Cambridge Vehicle Dynamics Consortium and the Center for Sustainable Road Freight. And he leads Cambridge University Engineering Department's Transport Research Group and the, de and the department's research theme, Energy, Transport and Urban Infrastructure. He serves on, on the editorial board of four international journals. 
His research covers the mechanical, civil, and materials aspects of road transport engineering. He has authored or co-authored many peer-reviewed papers on dynamic loads of heavy vehicles, road and bridges response and damage, advanced suspension design for heavy vehicles, heavy vehicle safety and mobility, heavy vehicle fuel consumption and decarbonization, and the micromechanics of asphalt deformation and fracture, your field. So David, we are really looking forward to your perspective on electrification of Europe and the world. Warm, warm welcome. Thank you. Clicker, important. Very good. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm coming to the end of a long, long career on heavy vehicles. You've just heard a summary of it. Uh, and so I hope I'll bring some, uh, some insights from the heavy vehicle industry. The Centre for Sustainable Road Freight, which I lead, is a combination of engineering and logistics. And that's very important because the energy transition is in the road freight sector is all about logistics and not about engineering. It's about how do we deliver the freight that needs to go, uh, needs to be delivered. So when we think about decarbonisation, we should at least start by thinking about the low-hanging fruit. And there are a bunch of engineering things that you can do to make vehicles more efficient. And there are things like improving the tyres, the rolling resistance, the aerodynamics, making vehicles lighter, improving driver performance, uh, use of higher capacity vehicles, all of which can dramatically reduce the energy consumption of vehicles, and all of which are critically important in the electrical transition uh, where we're seeking to get maximum range from vehicles. So it's very important that we have efficient vehicles that use energy uh, as well as they possibly can. There's also a bunch of logistics things that we can do. For example, we can collaborate between operators. One operator can bring home uh, another, another operator's load, for example, sharing loads, backhauling, improving uh, improving vehicle fill, uh, relaxing time constraints. Uh, we need to think about reducing demand. It's not really great when people order five pairs of shoes and send four of them back uh, in their home delivery systems. Uh, and vehicle fill is a critical thing. All of those things really matter, and they matter more now than they ever have before while we're trying to make things as efficient as possible. So we mustn't forget about them. But they are not enough. There's not enough stuff there to reach net zero. And you can look at it in any way you like. You cannot reach net zero with, or near zero, which I prefer, you can't get there with these measures alone. You need to change the energy source, and there's three options, electricity, biofuels, and hydrogen. I'm going to mainly talk about electricity. Biofuels, I'll give you the very quick summary. There's not enough of it to go around. Biofuels needed much more for aviation and maritime for shipping, uh, and we need to do everything else that we possibly can for road freight. Hydrogen I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, the bottom line with hydrogen is it's way too expensive for any logistics operator to use uh, for their operation. So it's electricity that we're going to focus on. When we think about electrification, uh, we need to start with urban freight because urban freight is where it's starting. And if we think of the road network here and the road network you know, sort of shown schematically, has distribution centres, supermarkets, consolidation centres, and cities that hang off the end of these motorway networks. And in cities, you can do urban freight with electric vehicles. Parcel deliveries can be done with battery electric vehicles. You can do deliveries to supermarkets and convenience stores and in-city in shops all with vehicles that start on the edge of town, charge up overnight, uh, possibly charge a little during the day, opportunity charging, uh, and go back to their, uh, their hub. Uh, similarly with uh, refuse collection vehicles and so on. So all of this is rolling out now. It's happening in our streets and cities, and it's building the technologies and the supply chains 
uh, for higher capacity battery electric vehicles. So this is where the energy transition is starting in road freight and in not so many years time, 10 years time perhaps, we'll look back and say, why did we ever run those smelly diesel vehicles in our cities? We've got much cleaner, uh, quieter and uh, more efficient ways of, do of doing the urban freight task. When we think about the strategic road network, we can think about batteries, but also we can think about uh, electric road systems, dynamic charging. That's one of them, which is uh, not very welcomed here today. Here's another one. Uh, <clears throat> the idea is that you get your charge to vehicles um, on, on the motorway, you charge the batteries, you run the vehicles on uh, electricity, you get the electricity to vehicles not in a box carried underneath the vehicle, but in a wire, much more efficient way to transport electrons. Uh, and you can use that charge to get you from the highway network to the local consolidation centre or hub or distribution centre. So the interesting question becomes, how do you design that system of um, dynamic charging to give you the, uh, the most effective, cost-effective uh, system. And what you have to recognise from the start is that the, the electric road system is not going to go everywhere. There will be places on the edge of the network where you will have to run on batteries and where you will have to have static charges uh, and uh, there will be a, a radius of battery-powered activity. And, and that they're going to be all around the country. And my example, of course, is the UK where I'm based. But when you think about this overall system, you have three big components. One is the electric road system itself. The second is all the batteries and all the vehicles. And the, th <coughs> the third is the static charging capabilities. And you can <coughs> think up various scenarios. And here you see we've got what we call light, medium, and heavy. This is the most heavily truck trafficked routes in the UK. This is uh, a, a few more slightly less and a few more slightly less truck trafficked routes. So this is what we call light, medium and heavy scenarios for electric road system. And the interesting question becomes, how do you work out the, the, the best arrangement? What is the best arrangement? You see, if you have a, sh a small network of electric roads, then the batteries in two or three hundred thousand trucks all have to be bigger. And you have to have more static charges, and that comes all comes at a cost. If you have a bigger electric road network, that costs you more in the infrastructure, but all the batteries on all the trucks can be smaller, and uh, you need less static charges. So where is the sweet spot in all of that? And that's an interesting question. Is somewhere in the middle of that, there's an optimum. So what is very important is to look at the actual real logistics done by real freight operators. Anyone who tells you that you can base the decisions here on the average length of journey is completely deluded. The average length of journey ends at a distribution center where it turns into another journey 30 minutes later of the same average length. And if you don't account for the fact that you've got 30 minutes between those two average journeys, you don't have it forever, you don't have overnight between the journeys, you've got 30 minutes or 45 minutes. If you don't take that into account, you can't understand the system properly. So the average length of journey is not a way to be thinking about logistics. So here's a simulation, and this just shows you uh, the idea that we've got uh, simulation, simulating drop-off tasks, rest, rest stops, depots, um, and various possibilities for charging. You could charge at a rest stop at a high rate. You can charge at a depot at a different rate. You can charge on the road, on the electric road system. Um, at, a, at another rate, how do you optimize all of this? So this is a uh, carefully validated simulation. And this is uh, a little case study looking at a single 
day in the life of one truck from one operator. We'll call them Operator H. We've looked at many, many such journeys. And this is a journey in the southeast of England. There's London just there, a bit hard to see. The journey starts at the red dot. It goes out to the west and comes back again. It does a delivery, comes back again, goes down to the south and does a delivery and comes back again. goes all the way around London there and then comes all the way back again. This is 18 hours in the life of a single truck, two shifts. Now, if you wanted to uh, charge to do that on an electric, uh, on a battery electric vehicle by charging overnight and then running all day, kind of in the way that we would with the diesel truck, you would need 1,700 kilowatt hours of battery capacity. So that's about a thousand kilowatt hours, one megawatt more than any electric truck that you'll buy that you can buy today. So the biggest battery in any electric truck is about 600 kilowatt hours. So this is enormous battery uh, and clearly is not a practical proposition. The battery weighs about as much as the truck. Uh, if you uh, charge the battery during the scheduled time at the drop-off sites, that is the three sites at the ends of this route, then the battery size comes down to 400 kilowatt hours. And that is a practical battery size. You can buy a truck with that battery on it. Um, and so clearly that is a way to achieve uh, the, this, this journey uh, by as long as you had three large scale fast chargers at the ends of the line and you could charge during the 30 or 45 minutes that the vehicle is stopped there. If you charge at public rest stops, uh, which you could do at uh, four and a half hour breaks, statutory rest breaks that the driver has to take, then you would need 800 kilowatt hours of battery. So if you charge at 600 kilowatts uh, for 45 minutes or a bit less than 45 minutes that you have available, and they, they would take place at these spots here where the driver has to stop, uh, then you would need... 800 kilowatt hour battery, which again is bigger than the biggest battery you can buy in a truck. And if you had both, you stopped at both places, sorry, charged at both the ends of the line and the public rest stops, and actually doesn't make very much difference uh, because the public, because of the, the sequencing, it doesn't actually make a huge difference to be able to charge at the rest stops as well as the drop-off points. If you had some the light electric road system, you can see the electric road system here. And in this particular case, the light electric road system goes around the London Orbital Road, which is called the M25. And the vehicle would be on the ERS in around this top bit. Then this is what happens. With no static charging, so just fill up the battery and then use the ERS, you still need a megawatt hour of battery because you're using it down in the first part of the journey. If you now charge at the drop-off sites, you're down to 240 kilowatt hour battery. And that's the same size as the battery in a bus. Uh, and at the 240 kilowatt hour battery, the weight of the battery and drivetrain is not all that different from the diesel that it's replacing. So that's a pretty good place to be. Uh, electric road here plus charging at the drop-off points. If you... Uh, don't charge at the drop-off points, though, just at the public rest stops, you're still back at the 794 kilowatt hours of battery because you use that all up down at this first part of the journey before you start to get onto the electric road at all. You still you need 794 kilowatt hours to complete the first part of the journey. And uh, if you charge at both, you're at 240. And so it goes on. If you have more ERS, and here are the two medium and heavy ERS versions. You can see what happens is that you get ERS down here. This is called the M3 uh, motorway. You get a little bit of ERS down here. And you can see what happens is the battery sizes get very small uh, to the extent that with the heavy ERS, you're down at Tesla size battery. You've got a truck with a Tesla size battery able to do this work. So the effect of the ERS is to uh, dramatically reduce battery sizes therefore dramatically reduce vehicle weight, increase payload, reduce carbon emissions, uh, every th and, and reduce costs. All very good. Uh, the more you have, the better. But there's clearly a point over here somewhere where you can um, 
where it's possible to do things uh, as long as you have uh, drop, uh, charging at the drop-off points. Importantly here, even if you don't have charging at the drop-off points, your battery size is less than the target uh, electric bus size. So that's, that's, uh, that means you don't have to have charges at the uh, logistics hubs. Putting charges in logistics hubs is a very challenging issue and actually is the big problem it, that we have, that we face. The biggest problem, in fact, is not technology, it's getting charges into logistics hubs. I'll talk about that in a second. So when you look at lots of journeys in the UK, lots of lo real logistics journeys through this kind of uh, lens, as I've shown you, then this is the story that you get. So the histogram here, this is the histogram of battery sizes. It's a bit hard to, to read, I apologise. There's 1,000 there and 2,000 here and zero there. Uh, and you can see that with no ERS, you've got batteries that come out to about 12, 14, 1600 kilowatt hours, which is completely impractical. Uh, and 90% of batteries are, are less than 1.1 megawatt hours, with a mean around about 600, 600 kilowatt hours. When you use the ERS, the, the light ERS, 90% of batteries in this case are less than 600 kilowatt hours, with a mean at 300. So that's a bit more practical. Uh, when you have destination charging as well with the light ERS, then this one actually is the same. It doesn't look quite the same as it is. But with destination charging, your mean is now 150 kilowatt hours and 90% less than 300. So you can see that adding in the ERS basically reduces battery sizes. That's what it does. When we look at the total cost of ownership of these various schemes, uh, we get a picture that looks something like this, and there's many versions of this with many different assumptions you can make. But what this shows is the total cost of the six-year first life of a vehicle. So a fleet operator buys a vehicle, runs it for six years, and then sells it on. And the, the total cost of ownership is the purchase price less the resale price plus the cost of the energy uh, and maintenance through the lifetime of the vehicle. And what we see is that this is our best estimate for uh, a diesel vehicle. We're starting in 2030, so this is a vehicle you bought in 2030, a vehicle you bought in 2035, and so on. Diesel baseline, we reckon it costs about 400,000 pounds to run a diesel truck for six years. Um, that's our best estimate. We're not making any predictions about what happens to the price of diesel fuel going forward. It could go up, it could go down, we really don't know. So we're just saying it's going to be constant. That's, this, that's the assumption. And here is what happens if you use a fuel cell vehicle. The total cost of ownership uh, is significantly higher. Um, and uh, because of inefficiencies in and the, the high cost of hydrogen, uh, it never catches up with the diesel vehicle as you go forward. If we had a battery electric vehicle with a 1.2 megawatt hour battery, if that was possible, then it wouldn't catch up either. If we go to ERS vehicles with smaller and smaller batteries, and here's one with 150 kilowatt hour battery, you can see that's going to be cheaper than a diesel vehicle to run uh, well before 2030, uh, really to, uh, to start with. If you could have uh, run battery electric vehicles with these small batteries, which implies a fairly dense ERS network, then all your vehicles are significantly cheaper to run than diesel. Of course, if a vehicle is more expensive to run than diesel, then somebody has to subsidize the additional cost of logistics. And that some, somebody is the government or the taxpayer in the end. The person that's purchasing logistics services, which is all of us, has to pay this subsidy. And that means the government has less money uh, for building hospitals and schools. If you, your total cost of ownership is less than the cost of diesel, then there's a possibility to, to uh, have a bit of headroom to collect tax. That's very important because we currently, in the UK any, anyway, a lot of tax is collected on diesel fuel sales. The government is thinking, where is it going to get that money from when all of those vehicles go electric? And the answer is energy efficiency provided by these electric road systems, which are light and 
low cost and use energy as efficiently as possible. That energy efficiency gives you headroom for tax. So some conclusions. Hydrogen will always be too expensive and I've written a couple of statistics here. Uh, this is a little code for those that know. Capital expenditure times two, operational expenditure times three. A hydrogen powered fuel cell electric vehicle will cost double the cost of a battery electric vehicle. It costs double now if you go and try and buy one and it will always cost more than double the cost of a battery electric vehicle because the learning curve, the rate at which the cost will reduce over time must be less, less steep for a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle because there's very few of them. The battery electric vehicles are on a learning curve with the entire automotive industry reducing the cost of batteries. Uh, and that means that the capital expenditure, the capital cost of a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle will always be at least twice as much as a battery electric vehicle. At the moment, that means you can, you can buy a battery electric vehicle for 300 pounds, 100,000 pounds. You can buy a hydrogen truck for 600,000 pounds if you try and actually buy one. Uh, and I've, I have tried that. I've done that. Uh, for, a, for a project, and that's, th that's how the answer comes out. So the cost, capital cost is twice. The operating cost will be three times, and that's because of the cost of energy. The cost of hydrogen will always be three times the cost of electricity to do the same work because of inefficiencies in the manufacture and transport and use of hydrogen, the whole chain of taking renewable electricity, making green hydrogen an electrolyzer, compressing, storing, decompressing, putting it through a fuel cell and into the drivetrain of the vehicle, that loses 75% of the energy. It's just wasted through that chain and that means that the operational cost of a hydrogen powered vehicle will always be, because of the rules, the laws of physics, will always be three times higher than the cost of an equivalent battery electric vehicle. So no operator in their right mind would spend double on the capital and three times on the operating costs of their truck. Uh, the only reason for doing it would be if it wouldn't do the logistics task. And if it couldn't do the list, and we've just looked at the logistics task and just exactly how you, you can do it. So the conclusion is you can do the logistics electrically and there is therefore no way that any fleet operator will spend double on capital and three times on operating costs for a hydrogen powered vehicle. So we can forget about hydrogen, battery electric vehicles, are available, able to pull 42 ton truck at this time. Substantial payload loss though, um, 20, uh, a 44 ton truck in the UK has a payload up to about 29 tons. This 42 ton truck with full battery, only about 22 tons. So there's a big loss of payload. You need, uh, at the top weight end, you need more trucks. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so we need some weights and dimensions changes to get to 44 ton trucks, which is the current arrangement. Uh, megawatt charging is coming. Electric logistics is doable at a cost. It's dramatically improved by ERS. Charging is the, tr is the challenge. Truck stop charging is necessary, but not sufficient. That gets you to those 800 kilowatt hour batteries. Warehouse charging is essential to reasonable journey durations. And the problem with warehouse charging, and in the UK we've done a bit of analysis, there are 30,000 warehouses around the, U the UK that would need substantial charging infrastructure. In many cases it will be cheaper to move the warehouse to the electricity grid than it is to move the electricity grid to the warehouse. So there's a big problem there in warehouse charging. And that is the thing that ERS excels in because the uh, electric road network in the UK, we reckon it needs 100 grid, grid connections, big grid connections. And you compare that to 30,000 warehouse connections to do that warehouse charging that I showed you. That's a big problem. 
So warehouse charging is essential unless we have ERS. Electricity supply, <coughs> supply to warehouses is very challenging. It's a major infrastructure issue. The combination of BEV, battery electric, plus ERS is the lowest cost, lowest carbon, lowest weight. It reduces battery size by a half or uh, to a half or a quarter. Uh, it eliminates the loss of payload on those heavy trucks at the top end. There's headroom for recovery of tax by the government. It eliminates most static charging in thousands or tens of thousands of warehouses and grid connections. And that we can't underestimate that. And it's good for aviation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was full on. Uh, we have time for one question only, and then we have to move on to the next group. Uh, I just, it will be the first one, then I would like to... Thomas Pittler? Are you here? Thank you very much for all the explanations and your studies. Uh, quite interesting. So, uh, regarding all the truck trips you analyzed uh, through the road network and through the different scenarios, could you figure out some more general approach where you say, if I have on a trip distance of a certain length, if I have this percentage of ERS, I can reduce the battery size by the other percentage? Or is this too general to do that? We, we find it very difficult to do that because every journey has some different stuff associated with it. For example, <clears throat> what has the vehicle done before it got onto the ERS? That tells you the state of charge of the battery. You know how far did it travel before? Was it, you know, was it at a warehouse right there, uh, starting with a full battery? Was it, you know, 100 kilometres away and it's just depleted its battery and it's at zero? How long will it be on the ERS for? You know, is it going to be there on it for 10 minutes and then go off in the other direction, or is it going to be on it for two hours, able to 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 charge up? So every every vehicle in every case has different features to it and it makes it how you know what what is the vehicle payload yeah. um what is the topography like uh but but particularly what is the logistics task and where's the vehicle going and coming coming from and to so we haven't really found a way to boil that down into metrics and we're trying i have to say we are trying to do that uh to but the problem is is really very many variables and the only way that we found reliably to do it is to look at real logistics journeys yeah. or possibly to synthesize logistics journeys and then to do a sort of statistical analysis to um, in the same sort of way as I've showed you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lena. The, the yeah. rest of the questions we will bring on tomorrow. There are interesting questions about battery sizes and, and uh, why the subsidies for hydrogen are going on. Uh, but please, uh, <laughs> please uh, use that for, uh, for the next discussion. Yeah, sorry. I took those <laughs> applause. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for this warm up. Now we're ready for what I think is the heart of this confer uh, conference. We're going to uh, dig deeper into this meta study that started about a year ago. And I will not describe it more. <laughs> I'll leave that to, to Mats, who will also uh, take over to guide this session. Uh, and I will just do the introduction of the three speakers, and I know if you all maybe, you could come up, yeah, because now Jakob is also ready. So we need Mats, and we need Jacob, and we need Lars, where are you? There we go, yeah. Uh, and I will hand over to Mats Alakula uh, in, a, in a minute. <laughs> I'll just give the presentation first. Mats is a professor, and I need to read here, of Industrial Electrical Engineering and Automation at Lund Technical University. Or? Pretty close. Pretty <laughs> close. <laughs> I still got it wrong. Um, he's got decades of experience from electrical power train development 
and uh, both from, from Lund University, but also from Volvo, and also within the Swedish Electromobility Center. And then we have Jacob, Rogstadios, or Jakob, we do it in Swedish. Um, he's a senior researcher at RICE. Um, he's uh, got a PhD in computer science and uh, also experience as a senior data scientist at Scania. And he's also an expert in system or right system analysis of roads, Something electrification. Like <laughs> yeah. And then we have Lars Goodbolt. Or how do you pronounce it? It's actually Godbolt. Godbolt. It's American. It's yeah. like a, a <laughs> Godbolt. Okay, right. You're a special advisor at the nonprofit organization Norwegian EV Association. Uh, is also a leading expert on Norwegian EV policies and charging infrastructure and also knows a lot about charging behavior. And you will give the Norwegian perspective of this. So this is going to be a really interesting session and now I will hand over to Mats who will and introduce. So please, welcome all. Hi. <coughs> Let's see, where do I... You can see. I managed to make notes for what I should say now in a short moment, of five, ten minutes. And then I managed to displace them there somewhere in this room. But I have them here, not there, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. I worked with electrification of road transport for two to three decades. I actually come from electrical machines and power electronics area, and since that kind of technology is present in both hybrid and plug-in hybrid and full electric vehicles and in the charging systems. Uh, I've been, it's been unavoidable to work with that. And uh, <coughs> I'd say that almost from the start it became evident that the <coughs> partly or fully electrified vehicles, they are much more energy efficient than combustion equivalents that we know. And the last decades EVs have started to claim uh, a growing share of the market, and lately they have electric vehicles have become the requ a, qu a requirement that has gone so far so many OEMs have decided to abandon combustion engine development, which is quite significant, I think. Um, <coughs> so far, so good. But then I, I need to f advance this one. But up to now, uh, electrification has been interesting just because it is efficient, but it hasn't been a marginal uh, thing that we can consider and play with. But now it's serious. We know that we are up against the challenge for, for the world that is quite difficult. We, we have to reduce the amount of CO2 emissions significantly to keep temperature and order in the world in, in, in place. We know that we must break a path of CO2 emissions from all sources and uh, transport is a significant, has a significant share of that and uh, must take the responsibility for that share. So we know, and we know it is urgent, but do we really know how to do this? This fantastic drop in CO2 emissions that we need to accomplish. <coughs> we have and we debate several alternatives. We have biofuel. We have electrofuels. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Hydrogen. Uh, electrofuels. Um, <coughs> we have various forms of electrification. Plug-in charging at home. Fast charging along the road. We even have electric road uh, technology today. And <coughs> we know that all these technologies work. We can do what we want to do with a single vehicle with any of these. We know that already. Even the newcomer on the block, the electric roads, are, have turned out mature enough to be put on public roads. But <coughs> as well as we, we know that, we still don't know exactly the, the how to upscale this. The word app upscaling is um, the challenge of the moment. We, we need to reach 100% electromobility by this somewhere around the mid of this century. And there are many questions to answer. 
Uh, do we have enough biofuels? Can we produce and distribute enough green hydrogen? Professor Sebon has already told no. <laughs> uh, can we produce enough batteries? How many fast charging stations do we need? How much electric road systems would we possibly need if we want to go about this? The energy transition that we need to implement takes decades, and we only have one chance, in my opinion. It is a very important thing that we, we move in the right direction now. Uh, <clears throat> a country that is way ahead of us is Norway. Uh, they have already reached almost a one quarter of a full uh, electric vehicle fleet and sell over 80% full electric vehicles by today. Their experience of upscaling is, is, uh, uh, gives us a hint of what we are up against. That is why Lars... What was it? Good, good, good bolt is not okay. <laughs> Lars, that's why Lars is here. Uh, as a voice of the Norwegian EV upscaling experience. And I, I like to throw numbers at people, and I will throw numbers on you. Some of you have already been hit by this, but I will take one example that I extrapolate from, from Norway that I think is really interesting. I recognize that since about 2018, that for the last five, six years, uh, Norway has a density, I would like to call it, of fast charging stations at about one fast charger per 100 full electric vehicles. This is empirically found level, an empirically found level that provides a reasonable waiting time on fast charging stations at times of high traffic. I don't think you in Norway have decided to build way more fast chargers that you need than you need. I think that is a level that that uh, is in balance with the, the practical life with electric vehicles. If we keep that density, if we assume that, that the rest of the Europe is, is like Norway. Uh, then we apply that principle to the 10T comprehensive network, which is 130,000 kilometers across Europe. <coughs> and we assume that we have a fast charging station every 60 kilometers, as AFIR is recommending. Then the Norwegian level of den density level corresponds to, and hold on now, 1,100 fast chargers every 60 kilometers. You heard me right. 1,500, that's, that's about 100 football fields, I think, every 60 kilometers. Can we do it? I, I don't say that this is, uh, that everybody is like Norwegians, but, but I, I think we are not, in the rest of Europe, too different from Norwegians. There are, we have to take this serious. It is not obvious that the upscaling of electromobility this way is easy. It looks so now, but I have doubts, and that's why I think it's so interesting to, to listen to you, uh, Lars, and to, to hear the Norwegian experience. And here we have the motivation for this conference to answer the question of realism with upscaling of the different technologies, not only electrification with, with batteries and, and uh, roads and fast chargers, but, but all the other alternatives as well. What are the main obstacles on the way to a significant reduction of CO2 emissions from road transport. Which technology or combination of technologies gives the highest likelihood of success in abating CO2 emission from road transport in a 10 to 25 year perspective, which is what we were talking about. Um, that is, to, to answer those questions, that is one of the reasons for, for having this conference. Another reason is to present the results that have come from evaluating the, one of these technologies, the Elon Road technology that we, we will look at more today. Um, <coughs> to answer these scientific questions, this challenge that I've tried to talk about, the project Evolution Road has engaged an external expertise, external to the project, to approach the challenge and now I should show that slide. <laughs> uh, to, to, to approach the challenge in a broad and in an objective way. When we did talked about having this conference, thank you, uh, we said that it should be a result conference. We should present what we have accomplished, how good the electric road works. And we said that no, that will only be a, a conference where we tell how good we are, but not how we fit in. So we need someone objectively to look at how, how do this 
technology which works fit into the bigger picture. And Jakob Rockstadius at, at RISE has led the work with a strong support from a lot of partners that I will not uh, mention or by name you see them on, on the slide. Uh, we have had some co-authors that have spent, have spent a lot of time in, in, uh, under the leadership of Jakob to, to put this paper together that I believe all of you have access to now. And apart uh, in addition to them, all these acknowledgements for strong support that you see down on the bottom of the slide is uh, <coughs> a lot of specialists that have, have been following along the way uh, and supported and commented and, and made the, the documents as, as good as it can be up to now. But the, <coughs> the, we want these two days, today and tomorrow, to be used to challenge the conclusions that we have reached so far. We want discussions, opinions, we want feedback. We will work that into the final version of the report to make it better before publishing it in a, to a wider, much wider audience. And that with your help. So with these words, I hand over to Jakob from RISE to present a summary of the work so far. Thank you. Indeed, so this is um, at least an attempt to do an independent review of different pathways to decarbonize EU road transport and as much as possible by 2035. Um, it is, RICE is not tied to this Evolution Road project, although it's a very interesting project. Um, Evolution Road has provided a lot of information to this analysis, but so have a lot of other stakeholders including, for instance, the hydrogen section of Daimler trucks. So the goals have been to compare different pathways to decarbonize transport and try to do that in some kind of comparable metrics and to really look at what, what alternatives do we still have to decarbonize EU road transport in a quick way. To set a little background, so what are we trying to achieve? Well, the scientific advice for the EU is to reduce carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions um, from all of the EU economy by 77 to 87 percent by 2035 versus the 1990 reference level. It's quite significant. Um, for road traffic, we are today about 20 percent above 1990. We're not doing very well with the 25 years that we've had, or no, it's more, 35 years we've had to improve things so far. We have another 10 years to drop. Uh, it's going to be tougher now than it was. And the current ambition level that the EU has set through policy is to reduce, eliminate tailpipe emissions from light vehicles by 2035 in the new sales. There are no targets for the rolling stock. And for the same year, reduce the emissions from new trucks by 75%. Uh, Again, no targets for the rolling stock, and this is versus the 2019 level, not the lower 1990 level. The technologies we've looked at are the ones that both Mats and uh, David described. It's combustion engine vehicles operated with uh, fuels, fossil fuels, biofuels or electrofuels. It's battery electric vehicles, both new vehicles and those converted from combustion engine vehicles and you replace the powertrain to an electric one. And you power those either with what we call slow charging, this is well, more well defined in the report, uh, fast charging or electric road systems. We have fuel cell vehicles powered with only green hydrogen, which means that it comes from a it's basically sustainable, um, unlike the hydrogen that we produce today, that is all from fossil fuels. And this is produced in multiple different locations. We've looked at different prices that result from this, as well as different ways of transporting and delivering it to the truck, either in gaseous or liquid form. And they have different properties associated with these. 
And we try to summarize this in a levelized cost per kilometer, levelized emissions per kilometer, and estimate the kind of maximum scalability. So how much of the EU road transport by kilometers could run on this fuel technology by 2035? If all goes well and if things don't go so well. And we also try to, th this is not the focus of the study, but we have looked at complementary strategies to re re reduce transport demand, which is, it's really complementary. It's not something that you can do instead of. Even if you reduce transport demand by half, you still need to decarbonize road transport as quickly as you do otherwise. You cannot, uh, as, no matter how quickly we decarbonize road transport, we likely still need to work with demand reduction. So they are complementary. We try to cite sources whenever we find them, uh, but we do need to do a lot of unit conversions, and for some things there aren't really good sources, and so then we have to do some calculations. For road transport demand reduction, um, th the short version is that we don't really see mature, scalable um, template solutions that you can just roll out. There are lots of examples of initiatives that have reduced demand in some little uh, focus area where they have a neighborhood or so on, but, but to say that you can achieve this on an EU level by 2035, I strongly doubt it. Um, when we talk about moving cargo to rail um, and waterways, well, the vast majority of both cargo and people transport goes on roads today. So move, doubling the capacity of rail and waterways is not going to have a significant impact on the road transport. So unfortunately, that is also not going to result in a significant emissions reduction in this time frame. And in fact, we, from what we understand, the, the most likely way impact this will have is that it will reduce the in, uh, increase rather than actually reduce the amount of transport. Biofuels, they are the first technology that we look at. They are in use today. They contribute about 6% of EU road transport by final energy. Um, they, if we assume a reasonable cost of carbon and account for that as part of the, the system cost of using biofuels and fossil fuels, then they have roughly the same cost as fossil fuels by 2035. But it's very difficult to increase supply of biofuels because very quickly you start competing with food production. This means that you need new technology, you need new carbon sources, um, things like wood residues. Um, and, and many of these come with increases in cost, and that is not very likely. If you need to triple the cost of the product, you're less, less likely to sell it, right? So we don't think biofuels can be scaled up much further. A little further, maybe, but not much further. Hydrogen and e-fuels. Um, the short version is exactly what David said. It's way too expensive. It's The green hydrogen is not available today. You can barely buy it. Supply is much less than the proposed uses by 2035. And by that, I mean the, the different sectors in which we want to use green hydrogen, the so, uh, the sum of the demand from those sectors, if we use it, then if we rank these as, this is based on Michael Liebreich's hydrogen ladder, if we, we estimate this demand from the sectors that have higher merit than road transport, things like fertilizer production, steel production, where there are fewer alternatives, then we don't have any hydrogen for road transport, because demand is still greater than supply. And if whether there's a demand, that depends on the cost, of course, but, but at least we should use it where, it where it actually results in great decarbonization. And this also means that if we use green hydrogen in road transport, we are not having any carbon reduction from a system level. We're just forcing somebody else to use fossil fuels somewhere else. Um, it's expensive through all pathways that we look at. There is no pathway that leads to cheap hydrogen. There are studies that say we can have cheap hydrogen, but they, as far as we can understand, neglect to count several 
costs included in this chain. And uh, we have looked at a lot of studies. We haven't had time to read all studies. There are plenty more. Um, but this is really the best of my ability to, to look and understand this. There is also very little potential for cost reduction when you start adding up all the costs that are involved. Most of them are not things like reducing the cost of the electrolysis. That is not going to bring down cost by two thirds. That is going to bring down cost maybe 5%. percent e E-fuels, um, most of the fundamental problems with hydrogen come with transporting hydrogen in some way. A lot of those problems are solved with e-fuels. E-fuels are much easier to transport than hydrogen. Unfortunately, it's even less energy efficient and the cost is not any more attractive. Uh, it also requires a carbon source. So in addition to requiring this green hydrogen supply, you now need su sustainable, hydrogen, uh, su sustainable carbon. Either you do that with bio, biological sources, then you compete with biofuels and reduce the supply of those. Or you can do um, carbon capture in some way, and that technology is not available in a way that we can scale it up. Um, certainly not in a cost-efficient manner. W do you want to invest in this? Well, probably not, given that we also try to phase this, phase this out. So by the time you might have a mature technology and you have your plant up and running, then it's time to ramp down. Battery electric is the only pathway that we see is really scalable, that you can affect a large share of the transport system in this time frame. Compared to the other solutions, it offers the lowest cost. Um, the electricity supply is rapidly decarbonizing, which means that if you replace the vehicles with electric ones, they will continue emitting less and less and less the longer we use them. The Batteries, however, do contribute significant uh, emissions during production, and this is primarily an issue for light vehicles. Because if you, well, all vehicles need batteries, we have many, many more light vehicles than heavy vehicles, and therefore we end up with about 90% ish of all the batteries sitting in light vehicles. So it's those that contribute the embodied emissions. And we also have a problem with uptake in the, in the near term. So we sell new vehicles, and that's how we imagine battery electric vehicles are going to enter the stock. But we primarily sell new vehicles in North and West Europe. South and East Europe doesn't really buy that many brand new vehicles. They buy primarily used vehicles from North and West Europe. So they are going to be maybe 10 years behind if we go that pathway of introducing new vehicles. Electric road systems, um, our, I should say, ballpark estimates here. Uh, it, it's a technology that it's possible to reach the lowest cost of charging. It's not necessarily the lowest cost of charging. You can always offer a higher price, but um, w we see potential for reaching this. We see at least 50% smaller battery packs, and there are lots of studies that show this to conclude roughly the same thing. is between 50 to 75%, pretty much what David said. Um, this reduces the vehicle cost on the heavy side, and it reduces embodied emissions from light vehicles. We don't see much cost reduction on the light vehicles because you also need new ERS-specific parts in the vehicle. And we do expect batteries to cost much less in 2035 than they do today. So today, the vehicle would be cheaper, to, but today we don't have electric roads. We do believe electric roads would contribute to reaching 100% electric new vehicle sal sales at an earlier date. For, for light vehicles, this isn't going to make that much difference because we already ban anything else from 2035. For heavy vehicles, this would likely um, add more electric vehicles to the vehicle stock. As I will come back to on the next slide, ERS would also make conversions, so replacing retrofits, converting in combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicle, more likely to happen. Um, we don't go in depth into this, but, but for reasons I will explain, it seems much more feasible for such a market to take off 
if we have a, a, a pan-European electric road system. The problems with ERS are, of course, that it's a, it's a massive upfront investment. We need to build at least 50,000 kilometers. That's the, the length of the 10T core network. And this, we expect, would only be sufficient for heavy vehicles. If we need passenger cars, light vehicles to participate, we expect at least 100,000 kilometers in Europe by 2030. When we look into the bottlenecks, would this be feasible? Um, we don't really find engineering problems. Uh, we do maintain a lot of roads. We, the, what the technology suppliers say we can build out at that like kilometers per hour, kilometer per day, it scales. But to get this through the regulatory processes and actually get um, support in the alternative fuels infrastructure, reg reg infrastructure regulation by 20 2026 in the revision, and then make decisions and, and do all the planning and national approval processes and so on, that, that will be challenging. It's maybe doable. It was doable for COVID and the vaccines, but can we do it for this? I don't know. There's also very little support from the vehicle OEMs, uh, and I think they don't gain so much from it, honestly. Uh, might be a reason. So it's unclear if this is on the table or not. We're not sure. Electric retrofits. Um, this is a table trying to summarize some rough estimates of how feasible it is from an economic perspective with and without access to dynamic charging, as well as for light and heavy vehicles. For with only static charging, then we have larger batteries. So we have um, an investment cost for retrofit in parts only that is quite significantly greater than the estimated re sum of reduction in operating costs over half of the lifetime of an electric vehicle. If we add dynamic charging for the light vehicles, then we are suddenly closer. We're still on the low end of, of getting this return on investment. Um, but it's at least in the same magnitude. If we look at the heavy vehicles, um, it's pretty much the same thing. We, for, with static charging alone, we are not probably going to make the money back from a retrofit. Uh, and this is excluding the labor, which is the cost of labor is going to differ a lot by where you do this and, and how mature the technologies are, how modular the vehicles are and so on. With dynamic charging, you are definitely going to make the money back. But it's not, and, and it's red because there was an error in the report here. The report contains other numbers. I'm not quite sure how we ended up with those. Sorry. Uh, we'll fix that. Um, it's not clear cut but it, it should be enough to show that this is worth investigating. If we talk about instead how, how much of, if we, we get an electric road system in place by 2030, then by 2035, how much of the rolling electric vehicle stock is going to be adapted to using an electric road? Because none of the vehicles out there today could use this. So how many of the vehicles would be added after 2030, between 2030 and 2035? And we see that in the Nordics here, yeah, sure. We're going to have sell a lot of vehicles before this time, before 2030, that will not be ready to use an electric road. It doesn't mean we will have fewer vehicles here than we will somewhere else, but a smaller ratio. If we look at South and East Europe, and if we look at trucks, then most of them. We are going to ramp up sales, and in the meantime, we build out electric roads, and then the, the vehicles should be adapted to this because they were introduced after the introduction of the, uh, the new charging method. From a cost-saving perspective, we see fossil fuels and biofuels on par with each other in cost, and this is including then a cost of carbon that is reasonable, not an unreasonable cost of carbon as we have today. Um, we see that in the light duty segment, the vehicle itself contributes a lot of the lifetime cost. 
which means that if you reduce the cost of the fuel, you don't have that much impact. Um, we see that fast charging is estimated to cost about twice as much as home charging at night, but it's still not a massive difference. It might feel different when you own the car, but it, over the lifetime of the vehicle, what you spend on having this vehicle is mostly dependent on whether you buy a premium or, or basic car. With dynamic charging, yes, it could likely be even cheaper. It's, it's certainly the cheapest daytime charging, but it's, it's again, this is not the deal breaker in terms of cost, whichever method you charge the vehicle. Um, E-fuel's not recommended. Uh, it, there's so much inefficiencies in this that we don't see the cost coming down. For heavy vehicles, the, it's mostly operating costs. This does not include the cost of trailers, which you might have other. Uh, you might have some um, rules of thumb of how much is capital expense and how much is operating expense in in heavy trucking, and that might uh, distort things a bit if you include the, the trailers. We see that battery electric vehicles, because they need large batteries, if you don't have dynamic charging, they will cost a little more than the combustion engine vehicles. But it's a pretty small um, extra expense when you consider the benefit of reducing operating costs in both in terms of energy and maintenance. Dynamic charging would probably reduce this a bit more. Um, if I remember, I will mention a limitation of our way of calculating dynamic charging cost that possibly underestimates the, the cost per user a bit. Um, hydrogen, even in the most favorable scenarios, uh, and this is pretty much when you, yeah, you, you assume everything to be on the side of hydrogen, then we can get costs that are probably comparable with the average expected cost for fossil fuels, and biofuels. Biofuels is a hundred percent biofuels here. Um, but going below that and going down to lev level of battery electric, we, we really do not see this happening in terms of cost. Much more likely that you end up, as David said, three times higher, two, three times higher in terms of cost. Uh, electrofuels, same thing here. Th there is no supply, there is no cost competitiveness at all. Greenhouse gas intensity. Um, we can see that all of the technologies significantly reduce emissions on the light vehicle side. We can also see that for electric vehicles, the production of the light vehicle is really an issue. If we transition all of the vehicles on the roads to electric, we have still only achieved somewhere between a 50 and a 80% emissions reduction. And we need to go down below that. So how do we go down below that? Well. Cleaning up the electricity grid is certainly helping. Now this is 2035 uh, grid electricity, which means that it's significantly cleaner than EU electricity today. Um, but we do need to reduce the battery emissions. And I'm not an expert in how to manufacture batteries. But from my understanding is that uh, most of these emissions come also from electricity input. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, which means that if you clean up the grid, you're going to reduce these emissions as well. But if you import batteries from China, then you will, they will also clean up their grid, but not as quickly as we will in Europe. So they, you will continue uh, having significant emissions. If you reduce the battery capacity per, ve per vehicle, that significantly reduces the emission per vehicle also. On the heavy side, we have instead operations driving emissions. So in this case, we actually can reach significantly lower emissions by electrifying than for the light vehicles. So in some sense, it's the light vehicles that are the difficult to decarbonize sector, not the heavy vehicles. It's just that we're not doing the heavy vehicles yet. Um, hydrogen, we are going to have to pretty much produce the hydrogen on site at the fuel station if we want low emissions, and we do that with pure sustainable electricity. 
as long as there are truck transports of hydrogen involved or as long as we use liquid hydrogen, there is very likely to be so much leakage and hydrogen does contribute to global warming that the emissions reductions disappear. Uh, we don't see any alternative to um, battery electric when it comes to decarbonization of heavy traffic. This is a complex and important figure. Um, when we combine all of these strategies, we, we estimate the total scalability. How much of the transport do we think can use each of the technologies by 2035? Then we think new sales of battery electric vehicles, sales of new vehicles that are battery electric, that will, um, the potential of that is roughly the yellow bars. So in the Nordics and West Europe, in light traffic, we will reach quite significant market shares. In South and East Europe and in heavy vehicles, it's, it's not as easy to have impact on this time frame because we need to gradually replace these old fleets. The average vehicle in Greece is about 15 years old. It takes time to replace this. Biofuels is green, it was about 6% today. This indicates a little more. It doesn't matter how we spread it out through Europe, because it just displaces uh, fossil fuels and the, the planet doesn't care where these fossil fuels are burnt. Hydrogen, the blue bars, um, what you see here is about five times the capacity that is mandated in the alternative fuels infrastructure re structure regulation. So the, the AFIR targets are about somewhere between a quarter and half a percent of the truck transports in capacity. Scaling up hydrogen beyond this by 2035 does not seem likely, no matter if you do massive investments and you have to consider then that we expected costs to be significantly higher than what you want to compete against and emissions reductions not that great. So why would you? Um, E-fuels, pretty much the same thing. We still need green hydrogen. That is expensive. We need even more capacity. Although it's a drop-in fuel, we still need supply to ramp up. We don't have that supply capacity today, so we're going to have to build it and then start distributing these and use them. And, and yeah, we don't see it being more than the red bar there, which you might not even see that it is. If we build electric roads, and electric roads here is really a placeholder for reducing battery size, increasing the rate of sales of new electric vehicles, so reaching 100% earlier, as well as doing retrofits starting in 2030. If we have another technology that can do enable those, except electric roads, then I'm all for it. Um, but uh, we haven't found one. And with these three together, we expect the... Um, what do you call that? Strecka de. Right. Um, that share of... So, so this impact would primarily be in East Europe and for trucks. That's where the, the retrofits really come in to make a major difference. If we look at the emissions that remain in 2030, they will be primarily from fossil fuels still. Uh, we have a significant share from battery electric vehicles, which is then primarily from battery production. And then we have this gray and black yellow part, which is the same as this part up here, but we take this and we say, okay, now this runs on electric. So what is the, we're not going to get rid of all the emissions because we still have some from operating these in electric mode. And they will be mostly from battery production. So they should be, they should be quite low. We also transition these to ERS, which means that we are lower emissions per kilometer than we do for these ones, on average. Uh, 
So then we have this left, and we got rid of this, this part here. So the gray part represents what we think is the, the maximum achievable additional reduction that we can achieve through very, very ambitious electrification targets. We don't think we can do more than that. If you want to reduce the rest, you have to reduce total transport by some way. Looking at annual emissions, we were hoping for um, 77 to 87% reduction by 2035 in annual emissions. That is the little black marker there. We see that in our best case scenario, we are somewhere here at 36% uh, reduction on average. We have pessimistic and optimistic scenarios, which in indicate that by the little error bar here. But really going below that, we don't see this happening in this time frame. And if we look at cumulative emissions, which is what matters for the climate, then we have a, a carbon budget. There is no like fixed carbon budget for the EU or EU road transport, but using different ways of estimating this, we get somewhere in this, this black bar. Uh, with it, it passes zero, meaning that we maybe already spent our budget. Um, but by 2035, th there is no way to, to get this within the budget, because then we have to stop emitting now. Um, we can get below here. The, the key thing to achieve, achieve, at least, is that in the current European um, Environmental Agency forecasts, we do not reach zero tailpipe emissions by 2050. We have done something like, I think, 60-70% reduction by then, and that is tailpipe emissions, which means that we're still running vehicles on combustion engine fuels by then. In our scenarios, at least, we reach 100% electric vehicles by 2050. Then we have no tailpipe emissions, and we're working with reducing these battery impacts. Um, and that is maybe doable. To summarize, we, we do not expect any further contributions compared to today's level from biofuels, electrofuels, or hydrogen. We expect further greenhouse gas re reductions from direct electrification, and we expect light-duty vehicle batteries to be the, the factor that counteracts this. Electric road systems would likely increase electrification uh, and further reduce emissions from battery electric vehicles, especially on the light-duty side, where we reduce batteries, battery emissions and reduce cost, primarily on the heavy duty vehicle side. We do need conversions. And we see some indications that for conversions to take off, we need electric roads. We need to shrink the batteries in vehicles. And that is for three reasons. It is cost, it is weight, which I didn't talk about. So you cannot put in more the new powertrain that you install in the vehicle cannot wait much more than the one you take out, because the vehicle cannot be used. It's not approved for that, it's not built for that. And battery supply is the third one. Um, the forecast for total EU battery supply kind of match um, expected new vehicle sales with the big batteries. But if we were to start converting batteries, uh, converting vehicles and put new batteries in those two, we don't have enough batteries. So we can't do that. If we want to use that battery supply and convert vehicles, we have to reduce the amount of battery per vehicle also. Building an electric road system by 2030 seems very challenging. Um, I would like to have inputs during this conference for how to do it. This is not my area of expertise. Reducing transport demand in this time frame seems very difficult. I would like input on how to do that as well. 
reaching the 2035 annual target for greenhouse gas reductions seems very difficult. But if we somehow were to replace all the vehicles, not only the new vehicles by electric by then, then we would roughly reach it. Probably not realistic. And there is no way that we can uh, not overshoot the budget. Thank you. All right, we have some questions from, uh, from the audience. I will start with a quick hydrogen uh, question. Does, there, um, does the cost for hydro hydrogen consider the dynamic prices for electricity between day, night, summer, winter? Uh, the, the ability to store energy? Uh, we energy. do not provide our own calculations for hydrogen. Uh, which means that you need to go to the sources that we have cited, but I believe so they, yeah, I, I think that was taken into account. They certainly assume hydrogen is produced with significantly cheaper electricity somewhere else. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Andreas Pettersson. Yeah, I was thinking about if it's uh, taken in consideration for the light vehicles, uh, the light duty and passenger cars uh, for the big cost for ERS conversion. Um, will it be feasible to use it or um, will the customer actually be willing to buy it because it's a considerable cost to do it when you have static chargers? And in the diagrams, it looked like um, the ERS vehicles should be cheaper on the vehicle cost than the static chargers. And I was thinking, is, is that in taken in consideration with the DC-DC converters and the pickup? Um, so on the light vehicle side, yeah. we, we see that the cost is similar doing a conversion for a big battery plug-in charging and a small battery ERS charging okay. vehicle. Because you already use half the Re battery capacity. Yeah. But we don't really see that you can do it on the big battery version because you can't fit that big a battery into the car. Yeah. So you will, in that case, you, you can actually choose between a short range vehicle that is statically charged or dynamically charged. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I understand what you mean. Thank you. All right, uh, one more question. Uh, and please add your um, uh, names in the questions uh, so I can find you. But David, you had a Yes, thank you very much. It's a great presentation. I wonder whether you've considered um, retrofit of ERS pickup technologies on battery electric vehicles. We have not. Uh, because that would seem to be the low-hanging fruit. If Once yes. you've got the battery electric vehicle, then to add the ERS pickup, whether it's on yes. the bottom or the top, and then reduce the battery size, put that battery somewhere yeah. else. That would seem to be the oh, quick and easy thing to do. Yeah, we, we have not included that, but yes, I agree. I, one other uh, technology we haven't looked at that might have some potential, that we, was not mentioned at all in the study, is um, electric trailers that can effectively remove the emissions associated with pulling a trailer because you get a effectively weightless trailer. It cannot push the truck, but it can push itself. So by using this, you can at least decarbonize that half of uh, fossil fuel emissions from existing uh, combustion engine trucks. Thank you to the audience. We will uh, forward the, the rest of the questions. And we will have also another way that Lina will mention for uh, collecting um, reflections on the study. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jock. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, so sorry, one more thing. I think David really has a point with his last slide yes. there and the, that ERS helps airplanes, because it does. It frees up biofuels and hydrogen to use in airplanes. So he's correct. <laughs> Just not, it won't look like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's hear from the Norwegian perspective then. Thank you. Thank you. 
so you were struggling with my surname. I, in Norway, we, we often have two surnames, and I bolded the one for to help my my Swedish. So it's actually Lund. So it's it's great to be here in Lund for the first time in my life. Finally, um, I'm Norwegian. I'm not Swedish. Um, uh, and uh, I'm here to not talk about my surnames, but uh, give you some charging insights from the Norwegian EV market. Um, and I have so much I want to talk to you guys about, but I only have 15 minutes, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so I work for something called Norwegian EV Association. We have over 120,000 mem members. They are all EV drivers. And we help them with questions that they have about driving your EV, charging issues, etc. Uh, we've been working for over 25 years to electrify transport as fast as possible. Uh, so we lobby a lot towards the government. We give insight about what the EV users want, um, etc. Uh, and make sure always the principle of the polluter pays principle. So it should make the, the easy choice, uh, the economical choice should be to choose green, choose the EV over the, the gas the gas vehicle. Um, yeah, and we do a lot of different things. We also test cars. And we write about them on Elbil.no, our, our, our website. And yeah, I'll try to be out in the field as much as possible just to kind of t t to feel how it is to be being an e EV driver. And we also do annual service as well. So we do know a lot about EV behavior and experiences. Uh, yeah, I'll go quickly through our EV status and development, um, looking at charging challenges, uh, and then trying to look ahead. And we'll have some time for questions uh, in the end. And this is probably why I've been invited. This is the market share of new sales. It's not 80%, it's 91%, so at, the, at this point, so far in 2024. And um, well, we write EVs. Uh, a lot of people talk about plug-in hybrids in that category. We just say that's EV that's purely electrical. So that's 91% of new car sales. Uh, and the competitor plug-in hybrid has been falling uh, behind the, the latter years. Our, tar our, oops. Yeah, our target is, is 100 by 2025, and it looks like we're going to reach that goal, actually. Uh, yeah, we have about 730,000 EVs in Norway now, and you could add 200,000 uh, more if you add the plug-in hybrids, but I don't care too much about them anymore, uh, to be honest. Uh, and like uh, Mats mentioned, we have an EV share for passion cars, almost 25%, so of the whole fleet. Uh, are we there yet? No, of course not. It takes a long time to change a fleet, as was mentioned before. Uh, we now have, yeah, our estimate is that we have about 3 million electrical vehicles in 2030. For heavy duty vehicles, so like lorries, trucks, etc. Um, we're like <laughs> uh, a, lo a, lo um, a lot further behind. We have about 1.5% of the fleet is now electric, but we're seeing an uptake in sales. It's now about 12%. But charging, this is why I'm here. How do we charge all these vehicles when we sell so many cars? And I'm here to tell you the tale of <laughs> uh, trying and failing, so to speak. We're building a lot of chargers every year. And this is kind of a curse of being Norwegian abroad. Everyone's like, well, it's your oil money. This, this is how you fund it, right? But <laughs> that's really not the case. This is mostly just the private market responding to, to a need from the, from the market and on all these electric vehicles we're, we're, we're pumping out. Um, looking at this graph, Mats mentioned that this. Uh, so the red line here indicates the amount of EVs we have per charger. And when I got this job three years ago, I was, uh, well, first of all, very enthusiastic because I, I, love, I love cars and I, <laughs> I love technology and I love to reduce emissions, so that, that's perfect for me. But, but then I thought, well, how can we build enough chargers? We're selling so many EVs. But actually, on the contrary, we're building more chargers than we're selling EVs. Well, if you compare, compare the two anyway. So now we're at um, 90 EVs per charger which is a record low. And we're over 8,000 fast chargers. Uh, pay no attention to the HPCs, and we just call them fast chargers. That's, as you see on the graphs, we're, we're mainly building HPCs, so high power chargers, anything above 150 kil kilowatts. Um, but when I talk about fast chargers, I include them, just so you know. So how did we re reach 8,000 fast chargers? 
So for the initial network, this is you know an old picture. This is I think a Pichot Ion or something, very short range. Uh, we had about five million euro in public funding, potential support, and at this point of time, we had 100% of the installation cost. So the construction, the digging, the hardware equipment, everything, but no maintenance or, or running. We've never had that. And the location pre uh, was mainly decided by the private market. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, in 2015, we saw, well, we need a national plan because the charger was just being built where there are a lot of traffic. So then uh, ANOVA, which is this state agency, said, well, we'll fund every 50 kilometers on all the main roads, which I, f I find you'll, you'll find quite like equivalent of, of, of EU plans, et cetera. And you see the map here of the national network. Very small sta stations, just 50 kilowatt chargers. Um, and this was mostly finished by the end of 2017. Then, fast forward even more years, and we saw that while well, we're selling quite a bit of EVs all across the country, but Finnmark, the furthermost region, didn't have much, much chargers and not much sale. So then, ANOVA, this uh, again, this public, um, um, all the government decided, well, we'll fund some chargers there as well. And kind of the same plan, every 50 kilometers, up to 50% of the installation cost. Uh, and then the uh, charging point operators responded, built that network, and we saw a very uh, high increase in sales in Finnmark. Now it's about 85% of, of new car sales in Finnmark are electric. Um, and then in uh, 2022, we saw some rural areas, and that's actually the, the image here with the yellow dots, where we identified some areas where the market did not respond. And again, we had a, a public tender with 50% of the installation cost, et cetera. So, do we use a lot of oil money on this? No, that's the short answer. 35 million euros is nothing when you talk about public spending. And our estimate, which is, this is quite conservative, it's probably a bit lower, is that around 5% of fast chargers has had some sort of support. So it's very low. So it's just the, the private sector that has responded. Of course, we've had several challenges on the way. We still need more. With expected EV growth, um, we, s we and, and, and kind of the government as well, we had this charging strategy that was pub published a couple of years ago, uh, where we estimate, well, we need 9,000 9, fast chargers in total by the end of uh, next year. And in total, 10 to 14,000, depending on technology, by 2030. Looking at uh, charging for heavy-duty vehicles, that's also, of course, an issue. Our target is quite ambitious. It used to be 50% by in 2030. Now it's 100%. And as I just told you, we're not, we don't have many HDVs yet at all. So we estimate we need a dedicated network for the uh, heavy-duty vehicles, about 1,500 to 2,500. And uh, today we only have a handful of stations. So let's do it again. So ANOVA, again, this uh, public agency is, is, is supporting both the depot charging. So if you're a local business and you just do like short routes or regional routes, you could get up to 50% uh, sponsored for your charge fast charging station in your depot. Uh, we also have public fast charging stations, but they are predefined on certain corridors in Norway, the most uh, traffically dense. And what we see on this, um, this support scheme is actually that the way it works is that ANOVA puts out a location. Well, we want someone to put up a, a charging station for an HDV at this location. Uh, up to 50% of uh, installation costs are sponsored. Um, and many of the applicants are saying, well, uh, we, we don't need any support. We'll just take the location. That's fine. Thank you. So we see a lot of interest and support in the market for HDVs because we've done it before. So they're building now um, fast charging stations without any support, because just because the, the areas are so um, appealing for the market. So other challenges, uh, <laughs> and, and this I could have talked about for a long time, but uh, charging is too difficult. And this is, this, 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 missed, um, this is connected because when we look at how many charges we need, right? This is a uh, Toyota uh, charging at a Tesla station. And because of the way the, the charge port is located, it occupies two chargers. Universal design, uh, it takes a long time to pay. 
um, charging. We know that 90% of charging is done at home. So charging at home should be for everyone. And when I say home, I mean also the ones living in, in cities where they don't have a garage or something, street, street charging, etc. cetera. Uh, we've had troubles with uh, grid connections um, and of course area uh, to place these chargers. Like Mats mentioned, they, they take some, some space. So I have a quick summary of this, what's kind of solved and not. So we have a charging law for a partner association and condominiums, condominiums uh, which more or less says that if I have a parking spot in an in a apartment building, I'm allowed to install that charging, uh, the wall box there. New buildings must be charging ready and a mandatory card payment also to make it easier to pay and thus making it faster, like a faster transaction. Partly solved, we have a new standard on universal design, which is on its way. I'm actually part of that, that group where Standard Norway is creating a new standard to make, make uh, the uh, charging stations uh, more accessible for everyone and easier to use. There, we have made some minor adjustments to uh, the grid regulation. It's a bit faster now to apply for uh, a grid connection. Not a lot, but it's <laughs> this is also uh, partly solved in the way that the charging point operators have kind of learned that this takes a long time, so they have to really look ahead of when planning, at least you know one to two years. And area, it used to be a, a difficulty for the, the, the charging point operators to find places to, to place all these charges, but it's been partly solved just because it's so attractive to have chargers. So a lot of smaller communities across Norway, we're a country that's uh, bigger than Germany in area, but we're only 5.5 million people. So we, but we're quite scarcely populated. We have all these like smaller villages and, and rural areas, and they are very keen on getting chargers, obviously, because you stop and you might charge your car for 30 minutes, then you might leave some money at the local stores. And also, um, there are other uh, interesting uh, innovations going on. This is a Norwegian company that actually has 16 stations in in uh, in Sweden, where it, it's uh, what you what you're looking at is a kind of a mobile container, and they have batteries installed uh, together with the chargers. So that makes makes it so that you can have a grid connection, which is a lot uh, lower than uh, what you would regularly need, because this could trickle charge during low hours, and then you could deliver high power at the peak hours, in rush hours. Yep. All right, looking ahead. So uh, I spoke about areas, one of the issues. And in Norway, we don't have many big cities. We have Oslo and, and Bergen, more or less. Uh, so for, for street parking, uh, they're now building um, AC, uh, charging boxes around Oslo. It takes a while, but they're starting to roll them out now. But they're also relying on fast charging hubs. Of course, we want the EV drivers to predominantly charge at AC boxes because it's cheaper. Um, but also, Oslo municipality offers support for chargings for uh, charging stations dedicated for taxis and uh, company cars, like light commercial vehicles, but also for heavy duty vehicles. And this is our trajectory because <laughs> this is uh, there is 90 at 2024. That's actually what has happened. Uh, but we're estimating that we will have um, a lot more EVs per charger. When we look ahead. This is uh, the association's uh, calculation, but also the calculation based on the Norwegian government, the Norwegian road agency. And this is just because it's, as it is stands right now, for many charging point operators, they're not making enough revenue as it is with just 90 EVs per charger. Um, and we expect this to be much higher to make it viable. So in 2030, we estimate 14,000. And if you remember correctly, the estimate is that we need between 10,000 and 14,000. But we're, all, we're almost at 10,000 10, probably at the end of this year. So our estimate is that we will at least have 14,000 by 2030. That's still over five years uh, down the road. And we expect that because of larger batteries, an average size is perhaps 80 kilowatt hours. And all these calculations, they're <laughs> quite detailed, so I didn't put them in my presentation, but I linked um, 
they're in the notes and I'm sure that the organizers will share the presentations with all of you here. So if you're very interested, you could go in there afterwards and kind of uh, delve more into it. Of course, we look at higher charging speed as well. We see that the CPOs, uh, Recharge, for example, a big CPO that's uh, located here in, in Sweden and, and Norway, they're saying, well, people are charging a lot more, but not necessarily for a lot more, of t more time. They just have more power when they're charging. And we tested um, cars this year, where four out of five cars this winter time, they charged at almost 97% of their uh, theoretical max. And this is because of uh, preconditioning, so new technology. Ordinarily, during winter time, an EV would charge very much slower. So all this kind of tech make, makes it so that you're spending less time at the charging station. Uh, better user interface and payment methods. That's a, that's a big issue here. Um, we have service that say that 40% uh, of the time, the EV driver is saying that they experience queues sometimes or occasionally at the fast charging locations. So that's 40%, which is too much. That's partly because of faulty uh, hardware and it takes time to install the app, etc. We don't have any physical card payments, but now we, we now we have that in the um, uh, by 2025 we have to pay by uh, bank cards, uh, or it should be an option anyway. All right, um, going in for landing. I just want to say I want to see you all at the Nordic EV Summit, which is in Oslo. Um, we're organizing that, and we have a lot of interesting talks on charging, on EVs, etc. So you're all very welcome to come join us there. And yeah, I think I have a few minutes for some questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple of questions about the Norwegian power grid con uh, uh, coupling to this. Uh, Jürgen Sinning is here. Yeah. And also Max had a comment about that. Uh, Bernard Jacob from uh, University Gustave Feld, France. I have a question about the business model of uh, potential ERS in Norway because you have long distance and not very heavy traffic, but you are quite advanced in the electrification. So, how do you see the, the business model? Because it may be quite different than uh, Germany or France or even Sweden. The business model of ERS. ERS. Oh, no. It, um, the thing is, in Norway, uh, we have some pilot projects in uh, in Norway on this as well. Um, and for Norway, I think the, the most viable business case is probably uh, outside the, the larger cities uh, for the buses as well. For the, the, the passenger car fleet, is just too late. <laughs> it, it, so we, we didn't even decide it when we looked ahead. And in this big charging strategy we, that we have, it's it's barely mentioned as well. So I think it's... And but of course, looking at these numbers and the statistics, I think it could be a very interesting technology for us, for sure. Uh, but it has to come right now because they're now <laughs> rolling out all the, all the financial support scheme for for uh, charging stations dedicated for for HD uh, HDVs. So um, so r right now um, we're just seeing it around the big cities for buses. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, Sydney. Yeah. He just stole my name. <coughs> uh, You've installed a lot of um, DC charges impressively. <coughs> Have you had any challenges with um, the grid, the power output, and the cost for it to distribute all these? Yeah. Um, the, the, <laughs> the charging put uppers, they've kind of stopped complaining now, <laughs> but it took a while to kind of get everything rolling and get everyone up to speed about what's the issue here. Uh, and uh, a big part of this was local uh, grid companies not being very proactive. So you would search for a while, I want to provide a charger or location at this, this certain spot. And the local grid company would say, we don't have power there. And then you would get back, to, back at the end of the application uh, bottom, and then you have to apply again, instead of the local grid company just saying, well, there's nothing here, but how about this area? So we had a lot of network meetings to kind of uh, agree upon what's the uh, <laughs> what's the issue at matter here. So it's it's definitely been been a been a case. We do have a pretty good power grid in general in in Norway, so we're kind of um, 
uh, spoiled in that sense. But in the southern part of Norway, a bit south of Oslo, the grid capacity is quite <laughs> almost at full capacity. And there we have to look at local battery solutions. So we have seen that popping up here and there as well uh, with um, yeah, um, big battery solutions just to kind of shave off the power peaks. Thank you. Um, Bobby, you had a question? Hi, Bobby from RISE. I'm a colleague of uh, Jakobs. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about uh, opportunity, opportunity charging, particularly when a truck is uh, loading and unloading uh, for several years. And we saw in, uh, in the study earlier uh, that that actually will play a very big role in reducing battery sizes. Has there been any uh, support schemes for this in particular, or any implementation of charging while a truck is parked at a loading dock in Norway? Yeah, uh, that would be what we call like depot charging uh, at the area. Uh, so there's been some support, not a lot. Um, I th and I've, I've been actually at some of those locations, like the bigger retail uh, companies, um, where they, or like the grocery companies, where they have uh, installed capacity. And it's partly funded, maybe I think up to 50% of the installation cost, but it's, it's also very like much... Um, how do you say, a, uh, a prestige project to kind of own. So, so far, the ones leading the way, uh, the bigger companies in Norway, like uh, Asco and UnoX, this energy company, uh, Schneider, they've all like installed some kind of to show off how it's possible. But of course, still the HDV, HDVs are quite expensive. They are also, by the way, being supported by the Norwegian government. They're still a bit more expensive, depending on if you just fast charge, the total cost of ownership is lower if you if you just charge like slow charging, but um, even with financial um, governmental support, there's still a bit more expensive looking at the whole picture when you fast charge. So yeah, there's been some support, but the market hasn't responded quite so much as of yet. Thank you so much. Uh, as always, the uh, the rest of the questions will be forwarded to Lars and the, and the gang, and we'll uh, continue the discussion tomorrow at the round tables. So be sure to sign up at those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.